On this Thursday night, the water keeps rising in New Brunswick, and the worst isn't over yet. The province calls on the Coast Guard to help with rescue efforts. We ask the Premier whether the Army might be next. Plus, personal stories from a threatened community in action. Also tonight, why anti-vaxxers still survive in this country's chiropractic profession. And the runway near miss that highlights Canada's stance on pilot fatigue. Newly released video from the dark of night paints the almost horror story. Ottawa tells us when changes are coming. This is The National. New Brunswick is now in uncharted territory. Today, floodwaters along the St. John River started surpassing record levels set back in 1973, and the peak is yet to come. Tonight, part of the Trans-Canada Highway was closed, and it'll stay that way likely for days. With so many roads affected in so many parts of southern New Brunswick, the Coast Guard has been called in to help with the growing number of rescues by boat. Hey, you're on dry land, man. For now, evacuations are still voluntary, but officials are pleading with people to leave the flood zones while it's still safe to do so. Uh, a night evacuation by boat is uh, a dangerous and risky operation, and if we don't have to go there, we don't want to. The threat stretches all along the river from Fredericton to St. John, but many residents are refusing to leave, including on the Kingston Peninsula, a vulnerable strip of land between two rising rivers. Kayla Hounsel has that story. The water threatens to breach the sandbags at any moment. This came up really fast. She's boarded up her windows and she's using pumps in an effort to keep the water out. You know, I have neighbors down the road. They've shut down, you know. Some have given up, but Heinz is determined to stay, despite all that water. You know, right now, if you were standing on my beach, you would be over your head in water. Her neighbors are sandbagging too. This is Jody McCormick's childhood home, and she can't bear to leave. You just try to save it. As residents struggle to save their homes, they're also worried about access for emergency services. With so many roads now impassable, they fear ambulances just won't be able to get to those in need. It would be a good four hours for them to get to a hospital. And in a crisis situation, they're not going to make it. This ferry is one of only two still operating. Typically, there are five. The water level is so high, the ferries can't let cars off. In this case, they were able to use sand to build a ramp before the road flooded. We start, have to start getting some help from the government or from some, some other agency. And in rural New Brunswick, we don't seem to be getting that as much as we are in the, the urban areas. Local MLA Bill Oliver takes us further into the flood zone. Everywhere we look, there are signs the situation here is far worse. In this home, the basement is already full of water and it could soon reach the first floor. We had five pumps and we couldn't keep up. So this is a real disaster. Friends came to help her move all of her furniture upstairs. We will never be able to thank the people in the neighborhood. We don't realize what kind of neighborhood we live in until something like this happened. And authorities say it's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets better. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Long Point, New Brunswick. New Brunswick's premier was on hand in St. John today, actually giving a helping hand to residents there preparing for the worst. He was moving heavy furniture out of a flooded home. I reached him a short time afterwards, back in Fredericton. Have a listen. Premier, we have seen the situation go from bad to worse to, to who knows what we'll see tomorrow. What is your most urgent concern right now? Well, thank you for having me, Andrew. Right now, we just want New Brunswickers to know that if they have experienced flooding in the past, if they're in the flood zones of the current impacted areas, that they really should look for alternative accommodations. We understand that many feel that they have seen floods before in the province and that they can handle it. This is a flood like we've never seen over the last few decades or maybe even in the history of our province. So a lot of surprises could come over the next few hours and days. So we ask them to seek alternative accommodations with family or friends. And if they can't find anyone to help, then they can call the Red Cross at 1-800-273-8255. Uh, 
800-863-6582. But at the same time, I do want to say that I've been inspired by New Brunswickers. They're stepping up to help their family members, friends, and complete strangers just because they're neighbors. And it's inspiring to see, and I thank them for being New Brunswickers and doing what they're doing to help their communities. And I, I am curious, why the decision so far not to call in the military? Because you, you talk about the unprecedented nature of the flooding that we're seeing. I, I mean, at what point would the province decide, okay, we need their help? Well, we discuss every single day what our resources are like at the moment. Are, are, do we have enough resources? Are the people out there exhausted and need more support? So every single day we're reevaluating what resources we need to deploy and if there are additional resources needed. I can tell you that we are willing to call in the Army if it's necessary and if it will support keeping New Brunswickers safe. At this point, uh, we've actually chose another route for today. We asked the Canadian Coast Guard to come into the province and help us. We have some people and families that are isolated because because of road infrastructure being flooded. So we want to make sure that although we'd like them to evacuate their homes, for those that are staying there, we want to be able to ensure that we have access in case of an emergency and so that we can support them. We completely understand people want to protect their homes, their belongings, their memories. It means a lot to people and we understand that. But again, we ask them to evacuate if possible. Uh, but if they don't, we will ensure with the Canadian Coast Guard support that we are in the area in case of an emergency and so that we can support them. Well, Premier, we wish you well. We know you're exceedingly busy there, so thank you for taking the time to talk with us. We appreciate that. Oh, thank you for all your time. I you heard the Premier mention New Brunswickers stepping up to help others, and we want to highlight one of them. You remember Darlings Island? We took you there yesterday. Tiny community that's been cut off from the mainland since Sunday because there's only one road leading on and off the island, and it's been washed out. That's where this guy comes in. His name is Rob DeCani, better known as Uber Rob. How are you, man? You can see why. He's taken time off work to provide a free water taxi for stranded residents. It's just terrible to see, like, the elderly, the kids, even, even just regular healthy folks uh, struggling to get through that water. When I first started on Monday, it was up to their hips, you wearing hip waders, and then to chest waders, and now it's impassable. The water is literally over their head and you have to dodge uh, some lawnmowers, uh, like tractors, uh, barrels, old docks. So it's not the challenge of being in the water, it's all the stuff and debris that's floating in the water. Thank you, Rob. Bill, anytime, sir, anytime. And you know, the surreal thing about all that is that in a way, he's been boating those waters around Darling's Island all his life, 30 plus years, but I'm betting he's never seen anything quite like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I might be aging myself, but I see that, and I think of Mr. Rogers, who used to say, you know, look for the helpers. No matter what happens, no matter how bad it is, there's always a helper, and there's one right there. I watch Mr. Rogers, too. <laughs> I think those, those moments are good, because it really does bring out the kindness uh, in others and helping strangers. It's impressive. You bet. Another story we are following tonight. Federal aviation investigators are still piecing together what led to what was nearly an aviation catastrophe last summer, that sudden aborted landing as an Air Canada flight tried to approach San Francisco. Our David Common has a closer look at the close call and how a tired pilot barely avoided a massive crash. The video is striking, with 140 people on board an Air Canada flight nearly lands into four other jets on the ground. Coming within meters of a crash, the plane lined up to land on a taxiway rather than the adjacent runway. A huge 787 on the ground, switching his bright lights on, perhaps to avert a disaster. Where's this guy going? He's on the taxiway. This United One, Air Canada flew directly over us. Yeah, I saw that guy. The latest investigative report provides a wealth of info, including on pilot fatigue. And right now, Canada has amongst the worst working uh, and crew rest times in the entire world. Indeed, Canada's pilots are often required to be alert for more than 13 hours. Elsewhere, the rules are very different. We couldn't do uh, some of the flying that you do in Africa, in China, in, in Latin America, in Asia, uh, or in, in Europe. With the crew in question, the experienced captain flew to New York and back the night before the incident, telling investigators that threw off his sleep cycle a bit. He fell asleep between 2 and 3 in the morning. His kids woke him up around 7.45. Air Canada 
then assigned him to a 9.25 p.m. flight. Once airborne, he started feeling fatigued about midpoint on the incident flight. But fatigue isn't the only issue. Construction at the San Francisco airport made the airport look different at night. As an Air Canada simulation after the incident shows, the pilots also suspected something was off. And uh, so I just want to confirm this uh, Air Canada 759. Uh, we see some lights on the uh, runway there. Across the runway, can you confirm the land? The Delta flight landing right before them heard the calls and told investigators, I assumed he had similar confusion to ours, that planes on the ground had their lights off, which helped create this misconception that a taxiway was actually a runway. There's a lot riding on this investigation. Had the landing continued for a second more, five planes full of passengers could have been left in flames. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. As David mentioned, airline industry experts say Canada's limits on how long pilots can fly in a day are much looser than those in many other countries. But the Trudeau government is looking to change that. Tonight, Transport Minister Mark Garneau's office told CBC News that new rules are coming later this year. Airlines will then have 12 months to comply. Right now, Canadian pilots can fly for up to 14 hours under proposed changes, pilots would have to stop work after 9 to 13 hours, depending on time of day, longer hours during the day, shorter at night, to take account of a pilot's internal body clock. That is already the case in the United States and Europe. Okay, let's shift now to a story from British Columbia with implications for people right across the country. There are fears that certain health professionals are grossly exceeding their scope with seriously questionable advice. Many Canadians, maybe you, see a chiropractor every year over muscle and spine issues, most without any trouble. But BC's top medical officer is now deeply concerned that an anti-vaccination agenda has infiltrated the profession. Take a look at these now removed Facebook posts from a clinic in Victoria. This one suggests vaccinations are leading to increased shoulder injuries in children. Another claims vaccinated children have more health problems than unvaccinated kids. Yet another links vaccines to cancer. And now the vice chair of BC's chiropractic college himself is being accused of trading in anti-vaxxer theories. Vicodopia looks at what's going on. Um, it's advice that, that goes beyond backs and muscles. About the best way to protect yourself from the flu is not a flu shop, in our opinion, but boosting your immune system. And one of the ways to do that is... Uh, Fresh smoothies and fresh juices. You know, the video was eventually ordered off Facebook because the BC body that regulates chiropractors forbids members from giving vaccine advice. But guess who's the vice chair? I actually can't believe we're having this conversation in 2018. <laughs> the head of this doctor's group worries about continued misinformation about vaccines. The scope of practice for chiropractors has to do with bone and joint manipulation. So he doesn't have any training or qualifications to talk about diet and immunizations. It's not just one chiropractor. We found several examples of promises to treat everything from diabetes and ADD to speech disorders in children. Like this Ontario chiropractor who also sits on his province's regulatory college. The idea is in two or three adjustments, you're going to talk. In Manitoba, five chiropractors were forced to change their websites after making questionable claims. There's over 7,000 practitioners in the country, and uh, unfortunately, there's, uh, there's a small subset uh, uh, that is uh, speaking contrary to our scope of practice. But is it really that small? When Edmonton researchers surveyed chiropractors' websites across Canada, they found more than a third claim to diagnose or even treat asthma. Look, if they're going to be a self regulated profession uh, and th if they are calling themselves science-based then the regulators have to step up to the plate and make sure that that their members are not offering services that are not rooted uh, in science Without my legs, Bob. as for that bc regulatory college vice chaired by avtar jussel it's promising to break its silence tomorrow vicadopia cbc news toronto 
Now, it's important to say that the profession's national organization does not oppose vaccinations. It says this, the Canadian Chiropractic Association recognizes that vaccination and immunization are established public health practices in the prevention of infectious diseases. The appropriate sources regarding vaccination and immunization are public health authorities and health professionals. Next on The National, MP Aaron Weir expelled from caucus after CBC News reveals the details of a harassment investigation, but exactly why he's out is in dispute. So some of my favorite people are here to talk about it. Andrew Chantal and Althea will break it down on that issue. not in good conscience allow Mr. Weir to remain a member of the NDP caucus. I'm confident that in this situation we have responded appropriately and fairly to the claims brought forward. So what the investigator found uh, was that I was sometimes slow to pick up on social cues and that I sat or stood uh, too close to people and engaged them in conversation uh, more than they wished uh, to speak with me. Uh, now that's far from what most Canadians would consider to be sexual harassment. Sexual harassment accusations might be the headline here, but it is not really clear why Aaron Weir was actually kicked out of caucus. Singh says the fact that Weir did not accept responsibility for his actions and then went on to speak to the media after parts of the report were leaked to the CBC was not okay. Weir says the whole process is just deeply flawed. At issue, here to talk about his reaction and more. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. And Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. Chantal, let's start with you. What do you make of this? It is, first of all, hard to understand what really happened, but of the way it was even handled. It's all very opaque, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and uh, the fault of that, well, to Mr. Weir and the NDP, because it's very hard to know uh, in this he said, he said, uh, who is really right. But it, the, the major fault over the long term is it's really hard to know, based on that, where the NDP draws the line at acceptable, not acceptable, uh, possibly poss uh, could be redeemed behavior. Yes. Uh, and, and a lot of smoke, but uh, really hard to tell what the forest looks like. Althea, I guess you were probably on the Hill for that and, and have been talking to people. What What is your sense of what happened here or whether this is acceptable to caucus the way this has been handled? Caucus seems to be really firmly behind their leader. Uh, unlike the David Christofferson punishment that we talked about uh, a few weeks ago, in this case, nobody had really anything to say, uh, contrary to the party line on uh, Mr. Weir being kicked out of caucus. Uh, it is uh, it's two things I want to say on this front. I actually disagree that it's opaque. I think we have learned a lot more about this process than we have learned about the process involving the Liberals, for example. We have no idea uh, why the the PMO senior staffer, um, Claude Eric Gagné, uh, quit his job and what the nature of the allegations were against him. The Liberal government never really told us what happened to Hunter Tutu and why he was removed from cabinet and caucus. Uh, we were never really told why Mr. Hare uh, it remains in caucus. There are in this case, uh, Mr. Singh came out and said, we have one allegation of harassment, three allegations of sexual harassment. These are the reasons why I'm kicking Mr. Weir out of a caucus. It has actually nothing to do with the report itself, uh, but it has to do with the way he responded to the report. Right. It is, it is unclear to me, though, what the line is here. For, and I think that's Chantal's point for the NDP, Andrew. I, is it you, you can't, because some of the allegations that we heard, anyway, the ones that we know, that he hit on women, and the women rejected him, and then he accepted that. Uh, so I, I am not sure, if they don't give more detail, I am not sure that that is good for the NDP. Yeah, less opaque than the liberal process is not exactly a high honor. Uh, <laughs> this is still extremely opaque, opaque not just to the public, but, a, but to, to hear Aaron Weir say it, opaque to him. He yes. doesn't know who his accusers are, he doesn't, except maybe in one case, he yep. doesn't know the facts of the cases, so presumably he would be in relatively weak position to offer any kind of defense to the investigator who was uh, collecting the evidence on this, so that's an interesting process. Uh, all we know to, to any detail is what he has said, so the, the actual facts may be much different, maybe much worse, I don't know, but yes, based yes. on what he has said, uh, the sexual harassment amounted to standing too close to people 
and uh, we're not picking up visual, non-visual or visual cues, I should say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, um, if it's that, then I agree with you. A, a lot of people are going to be scratching their heads, saying. Um, it seems like the real crime that got him kicked out of caucus was not uh, taking one for the team, not admitting his guilt, uh, not uh, sort of sucking it up. And if that's the case, then that's kind of an odd situation as well. You, presumably you should be allowed uh, to disagree with a verdict if you don't think you were justly treated. Chantal. Part uh, of the rationale that we were served was that uh, instead of taking one for the team and being redeemable, uh, Mr. Weir and he did do, do that, drew a link between his opposition, he's from Saskatchewan, to the notion of a carbon tax uh, and what was happening to him. And on that basis uh, was judged to be not redeemable on the rest of the stuff and so kicked out of caucus. But this is a leader that has allowed his, his uh, MPs to go and question his decisions on issues such as how you vote on uh, the attestation that yeah. you will respect abortion rights. So at some point, you kind of wonder in this magma of reasons what is happening. The other problem I think that many will have from the outside is that for a long time the line was, and it was pretty clear, that no means no, not just no to it. Uh, the extreme, but just no. Yeah. And the NDP tells us this is an MP uh, who, when told no, got no. Is it? I, I had heard a little bit, Althea, that there, this, there was a, an effort to find a way to get rid of Aaron Weir. Uh, I'm not saying any of this is, is made up, but that they were happy to take an opportunity to, to, to get rid of him. Yeah, I don't know the facts on this case. I do think that... Um, Mr. Weir is a little bit awkward. Uh, I think you kind of saw that in the clip. And it's not surprising to me that there were people who felt um, that he was not picking up on their verbal cues. But uh, Mr. Singh did know today that, you know, when Mr. Weir asked somebody out, basically made a romantic gesture and mm -hmm. was turned down, he he let it go. Like, he, yeah. he was not forceful. There is no sense that um, he was aggressive in any way. So um, I think, you know, sometimes politics is not only a team sport, but it's also kind of like the popular club at school. And sometimes if you're not in the group, <laughs> they just don't want to hang out with you. And, and, I, and I would certainly agree that I think from the standpoint of being a team player, we are probably crossed some lines in terms of the way he's reacted to this. Um, but I think the other point I would note, though, is as difficult as we're all finding these issues around sexual harassment, we're getting into even murkier territory, it seems to me, with uh, harassment. Yes. Uh, where, and we've seen this now with some of these stories coming out of Newfoundland, where, uh, what is it? Is it crosswords? Is it, mm -hmm. uh, there was one case where the finance minister in Newfoundland said that harassment was other people having a different point of view and ganging up on her in that respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, we need to get a bit more definition on, on this new territory of harassment without a, that has no sexual component yes, to it. Yes, like disagreeing with someone uh, is not actually bullying. And, I, I hope it's not because that's the whole newsroom culture and, too. And again, <laughs> you know, I, the specifics of any given case, I don't know. We, you know, we, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. We're, we're, again, we're listening to one side or, or the other, but I do think uh, some of the things that I've seen reported, it sure sounds like politics as usual to me. Okay, Chantal, yeah. and then I got to move on. Every time I hear about the, this harassment thing, I think back to Lucien Bouchard throwing his cane at one of his staffers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where would again, we be? <laughs> again, not the, again, not the not the not the best metric, but okay. A quick go around on electoral reform, Andrew. I know that uh, Andrew, all of you actually love this topic. Andrew, start with you. What did you make of what the government put forward? Well, I can't say I had terribly high expectations, but they managed to come in under them. It's a it's a bit of a damp squib. It is as usual with these with these things. It's very much arranged around the needs of the political parties. Uh, rather than necessarily the best interest of the public. So yes, they've warded off, or maybe they have, uh, some of these new menaces to our political process, whether you're talking about foreign money or, or hacking, et cetera. But they sure haven't done a whole lot about some of the old ones, i.e. Uh, robocalling, attack ads, push polls, yeah. Yeah. some of the things we know and hate about the way that our elections are run. And a lot of that is driven by money. Uh, there's too much money in the system, and they really have not, uh, I think, tackled that situation in any kind of comprehensive way. They have, thank goodness, put a cap on how long that election campaign can be so that I won't die in the next one. Althea, what did you make of it? Okay, I totally disagree with Andrew on that. <laughs> Good! I think, um, this is a, if you care and you think that the, gov the government should do all it can to encourage people to vote, uh, this is going to be a bill that you're going to support. Basically, it expands voting to a million plus Canadians living abroad. 
they are now going to be able to cast a ballot. It makes it easier for Canadian forces serving abroad to be able to vote. It makes it easier for Canadians with disabilities to vote from home and expands mobile voting. It brings back the voter identification card as a secondary source of uh, proof of where you live. It brings back vouching. All these things that we talked about during mm -hmm. the Fair Elections Act that had critics up in arms. And in many ways, it goes further. It acts on um, the chief electoral officer's recommendations that have been long-standing that no government wanted to bring in. It gives the commission they basically like the police cop of yes. election infractions, the right to compel evidence. Shocking that he didn't have that right. It gives the chief electoral officer the right to demand receipts before political parties get, in the last election, $60 million in taxpayers' money without an ounce of evidence showing that they actually had mm. spent that money that fixes this. And on the robocalls, it actually gives the commissioner the right uh, and the ability to go and look at the phone numbers of the people that called a, a really big gap yeah. and loophole that existed in the Fair Elections Act. Okay, so now, I agree with Andrew. There are things that the government is trying to do in this bill that does they does very poorly. The stuff on, uh, you know, trying to prevent foreign actors from getting involved in the election process. Mm. I don't know that any government really has the answer in the suggestion and the, these bills and this bill are uh, pretty weak and there are a lot of loopholes. And on the money front, they could have gone a lot further. They didn't. And on the privacy, it's a shell game. <laughs> it makes it seem like political parties are doing something when there is absolutely no consequences to the action. You have okay. no right to ask the political party what information they have on you. Um, and there's no third party, like an auditor, going to verify whether or not parties are saying are doing what they say they're doing. Okay. I told you Althea liked this topic. Chantal, last <laughs> word to you. Sorry. Oh, uh, it, to me, it sounds more like a lot of remedial stuff and not a lot of forward-thinking stuff. There's something very uh, tentative about it, and right. I find the title electoral reform to be a bit bold, considering <laughs> that it's mostly about nuts and bolts and not reinventing the engine in any way, shape, or form. Right. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Good news if you want to hear more of us talking about politics. Who wouldn't? At Issue is also a podcast. You get extra content and, of course, uh, the main podcast in uh, podcast form every week. This week on the podcast, is there room for two federal parties for sovereignists in Quebec? The Bloc Québécois seems to be coming apart at the seams. Look for it on iTunes. Any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Okay, always so much to say. Still ahead on The National, Donald Trump's latest storm. Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, reveals, contrary to earlier denials, that Trump did pay money used to hush up a porn star ahead of the 2016 election. What does it mean for the president? And a record number of left-leaning women are running for office in the U.S. What's holding back conservative women? Lindsay Duncombe went to find out. The woman who was baking cookies and had a machine connected to her midsection popping out nine babies. So to them, that's what a conservative woman was. So that's a stereotype that we have to fight against. Tonight on The National, Ottawa says it plans to intervene and make arguments in the B.C. government's Trans Mountain court case. The core of the case is about whether B.C. has the right to control shipments of oil through its territory. And that is also what's at the centre of the fight over whether Kinder Morgan's pipeline expansion project should go ahead. B.C. is against it, but Ottawa has vowed that the pipeline will be built. Also tonight, criminal charges against Volkswagen's former CEO over the emissions rigging scandal. Martin Wintercorn is accused by U.S. prosecutors of conspiring to cover up the carmaker's cheating. He resigned as chief executive in 2015 after the scandal erupted and is the ninth person to be charged by U.S. authorities in the case. And a decision by the organizers of the Oscars to expel Bill Cosby and film director Roman Polanski from the Academy. The reason? The revised code of conduct adopted following the Harvey Weinstein scandal and the birth of the Me Too movement. Cosby was convicted of sexual assault last week, but in Polanski's case, the decision comes more than 40 years after he pleaded guilty to having sex with a 13-year-old girl. So, do you remember this scene, Donald Trump on board Air Force One mere weeks ago, flat out denying he knew anything about that hush money? Did you know about the $130,000 payment to Tony Daniels? Then why, Michael, why did Michael go and make it if there was no truth or allegation? You have to ask Michael.
Well, it seems he might have forgotten to loop in his brand new personal attorney. And so the White House spent the day dealing with fallout from an explosive interview given by Rudy Giuliani, during which Giuliani openly offered up evidence that Trump has been lying. Keith Bogue takes us through that and what happened next. I'm giving you a fact now that you don't know. That's how Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York and now on Donald Trump's legal team, set up the brand new story of how the president paid hush money to an adult film star, Stormy Daniels. So they funneled it through the law firm. Funneled through the law firm and the president repaid it. Meaning the president funneled $130,000 through the firm of his lawyer, Michael Cohen, to repay him for buying off Stormy Daniels just before the election. Cohen is now under FBI investigation related to that. Never mind how weird it is that the president's lawyer casually talks about the president funneling money anywhere, the new story directly contradicts the old story Trump told just a couple of weeks ago. Do you know where he got the money to make that payment? Giuliani is effectively saying Cohen made up the old story that he paid the money himself and never told the president, which is awkward because both the lawyers are supposed to be on the same team, Trump's team. In any case, Cohen's apparently been on a $35,000 a month retainer for the president. When I heard uh, Cohen's uh, retainer of $35,000, when he was doing no work for the president, mm. I said, but that's how he's repaying, that's how, he, he, how he's repaying it, with a little profit and a little margin for paying taxes for Michael. Giuliani apparently believes that means the money can't be seen as an illegal campaign contribution from Cohen. There's no campaign finance law. Zero. It's nowhere near zero, says Stormy Daniels' lawyer. I think it's very likely that there is uh, criminal liability associated with how this repayment was structured relating to what was disclosed from a campaign finance perspective. You know, Rudy Giuliani says, well, no campaign funds were used, so therefore there is no campaign finance violation. That's not how the law works. And Keith joins us now. Keith, I hear what that lawyer is saying, but are campaign finance violations really the problem here? Well, I think campaign finance violations have always been viewed as relatively small potatoes in the investigation and among the least of the president's worries. The bigger problems are more likely to come from the fact that his lawyer, Michael Cohen, is under criminal investigation and the records of his work with Trump are in the hands of the FBI. And about that, Keith, what's the new information on that part of it tonight? Well, NBC News is reporting tonight that the FBI has been monitoring Cohen's phone conversations, not listening to them, just keeping track of them. We don't know what that's yielded, but it's likely the FBI had to have strong evidence of serious crimes to get a court to allow them to do that to the president's lawyer. Okay, Keith Bogan, Washington, thanks very much. Thank you. The Me Too movement has sparked a lot of talk about 2018 as the year of the woman, though, of course, it's a debatable idea. Take politics, for instance, where south of the border, Republicans seem to have some catching up to do. The party isn't running as many female candidates as their Democratic counterparts. And as Lindsay Duncombe explains, even with a push on to change that, conservative women still face some critical barriers. I'm Carol O'Brien, I'm running for Congress. The primary election in Ohio's 12th district is just weeks away. I'm Carol O'Brien. Nice to meet you, Ms. O'Brien. And every introduction is a possible vote. Every connection over pizza, a chance for first-time Republican candidate Carol O'Brien to get closer to Washington. You get to vote for me twice? But she's never quite sure what kind of impression she's making. They talk to other people and they talk about how quiet I am, which is pretty funny because never in my life have I been told I'm quiet or in the same conversation. I was also very pushy and aggressive, you know, pushy. And I, I think that's a lot just because I'm a woman. I'm a mother, a grandmother, and a prosecutor. The challenges women face running for office in the U.S. are especially tough for women on the right. I'm Carol O'Brien, and I approve this message. I do think that uh, the Republican women are facing a, a harder uphill battle at the primary level. There's a bigger hurdle to jump as a female to get the money. They want to make sure you're a viable candidate, that you're a good candidate, and that you can do the job. And my position is, look at my resume and look at what I've done. 
But I, and I don't think people it was that to resume, tough prosecutor, this, strong conservative military like, I mean, parent that attracted like campaign that. manager Jay Chabria. You can't just be a male white party forever. However, it's right now, in my opinion, it's still really in the lip service side of it rather than the action side of it. Of the 107 women in the U.S. Congress, just 29 are Republicans. It's a divide that could get much larger with the Trump presidency inspiring left-leaning women to run for office. More Democratic women do tend to run, and that's amped up this year. Michelle Swires teaches politics at Georgetown University. She says like so much in U.S. politics, success comes down to cash. Since 1985, the organization Emily's List has been raising money for pro-choice Democratic female candidates. The name Emily's List actually stands for Early money is like yeast. There's nothing similar on the right. The donors in the Republican Party, they don't see gender. They want commitment to conservative ideology. And so they don't care about the gender of the candidate. They're not likely to be responsive to a diversity argument. Rather there are steps to, to change that. <laughs> Thank everyone for coming to the launch of the, uh, our organization, Women Run. This is a fundraiser for a new organization supporting moderate Republican women. Big tent of the Republican Party has been shrinking and has not been all that welcoming to women and minorities, and that's something that we wanted to try to address. Co-founder Martha Eamon Conte says electing more women will help Congress get past the current ideological gridlock. Women tend to be more collaborative and they are willing to work um, across the aisle. We've seen with the women that are already in office and we'd like to bring more of that so that we can have our government working again. One, two, three. There are also movements to get young conservative women involved in politics. At the annual far-right festival that is the CPAC conference, one pink booth stands out in all the red, white and blue. I think we've got about 100 women signed up. Karen Agnes Lips started the Network of Enlightened Women with university chapters across the country. It's often very discouraging to be a conservative young woman, so that's why it's so important for groups like ours to exist where we're really empowering these women to speak out and become leaders. She says stereotypes of right-leaning women don't help. After covering one of News early meetings, a campus magazine put an unflattering image on its cover. What did it look like? This was a woman who was baking cookies and had a machine connected to her midsection popping out nine babies. So to them, that's what a conservative woman was. So that's a stereotype that we have to fight against. Uh, women have to do a little bit more. For Carol O'Brien, deciding to run more, meant getting over barriers in her but, own mind. Um, I always told people when I was younger I would never run for office because every person who didn't vote for you was like a someone not liking you. I've gotten past that. <laughs> The campaign is in the home stretch. We need people to walk, uh, pass out lit, knock on doors, talk about how wonderful I am. The primary is a tough one. The competition, one other woman and seven men. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Delaware, Ohio. Today happens to be the UN's World Press Freedom Day, and the theme for 2018 is keeping power in check. You might think, in Canada, press freedom isn't a problem, but according to the Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index, Canada doesn't crack the top 10. This country is ranked 18th behind many European countries. A reminder that when it comes to democratic institutions, there's just no place for complacency. I was shocked to, to learn that I had been the object of surveillance. The only word I have is disgusting. In some ways, there's progress. For example, after it was revealed that Quebec police had been monitoring eight journalists, an inquiry last year concluded more needed to be done to protect them and their sources. Also last year, Ottawa passed Canada's first press shield law protecting the anonymity of sources. 
But the Supreme Court is still considering the case of Vice Media's Ben McCo, who's fighting an order to release communications with his source, Canadian ISIS fighter Farah Sheerden. Yeah, trust with our sources that we won't give up our information to the police. And, you know, it's not just terrorists, it's, it's whistleblowers. In 2016, Justin Brake, then with The Independent, covered an indigenous protest against the Newfoundland and Labrador's Muskrat Falls Dam. It brought national attention to another side of the debate over the project, but it brought him civil and criminal charges that he is still fighting. Then there's access to information, the system that allows the public to get a hold of government documents. According to CBC's Dean Beebe, at the federal level, the system is broken. Access to information in Canada is in a terrible state. I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never seen it so bad. The, the delays in the system, the number of blacked out documents. Without the documents to uncover what goes on behind closed doors, how do the public keep power in check? Something to think about today and every day. Twelve acres on Toronto's waterfront could be a window to the future if developers have their way. Sidewalk Labs, which is owned by Google's parent company, Alphabet, wants to transform a largely empty industrial area into a connected neighbourhood, a showpiece for what technology can do in an urban setting. The details are still under wraps, but without a doubt, it would be built on data and lots of it. Cameras could be used to trigger adaptive traffic lights and crosswalks. Sensors could gauge when garbage cans and recycling bins need emptying. Even weather monitors could turn street lamps on and off. But as Jacqueline Hansen shows us, any talk about data collection inevitably leads to talk about privacy and whether the concept of a smart city goes too far. A few blocks north of the proposed smart city site, a public consultation. I think one has to really understand the extent to which privacy will be um, uh, protected. Who owns the data collected from residents and visitors, even which country it will be stored in, is unclear. We didn't talk about if we even want to collect data. All we're talking about now is mitigating the impacts of it being collected. There are concerns that current regulations aren't ready for projects like this. Our policies and laws are not set up and they're not up to speed to manage these sort of smart city ideas. Key side is this L-shaped piece of land around here. The proposed site is relatively small, but its potential to influence development elsewhere is huge. The purpose of Keyside, and I think Waterfront Toronto set this out as an objective, is that it be an experiment. That heightens the need to get decisions, particularly around data, right. We've known all along that understanding how people would be comfortable that data is being collected only for a specific purpose, not on a wild goose chase in the hopes that it's somehow valuable, um, that was going to be a top-level concern. Sidewalk Lab's complete proposal is expected by the end of the year, but there's no guarantee it will be accepted. Can we, in fact, wrestle these policy, these big policy questions to the ground in, in a way that satisfactory to the citizens of Toronto and satisfactory to the governments. I believe we can do it, but that, um, you know, it remains to be seen. While the technology is expected to be ambitious, making it a reality that the company, the citizens and all three levels of government can agree on will be the project's greatest challenge. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Now, there are many other cities leading the charge in smart technology, including Singapore with driverless taxis and smart traffic sensors. Dubai is also experimenting with using artificial intelligence to provide government services and collect instant feedback from citizens. And London is planning transit routes by tracking how people move around the city. We'll go deeper on the stories of the day. Earlier in the day, you can subscribe to our newsletter, cbcnews.ca slash the national. The National Today takes you insider journalism every afternoon. Tonight on the National, a goal for the Nashville Predators at Winnipeg's Bell MTS Place. Right now, they're ahead of the Jets, 1-0 in the second period. 
This is game four of the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. If the Jets win, they would be ahead in the series three games to one. They're exchanging words at halftime while Smith and Jose Calderon look to break it up. And that courtside tussle at Tuesday night's Toronto Raptors game has earned Drake a warning. The NBA says it reached out to the Raptors about the Rappers' verbal altercation with a Cleveland Cavaliers player, and the team was going to follow up with him directly. Now, we don't know what the consequences of another incident might be, but Drake was at tonight's game, and there wasn't any trouble. Toronto lost, though. They're down 2-0 to the Cavs in the Eastern semifinal. Ping-pong diplomacy is bringing North and South Korea together. The women's teams have decided they're not going to compete against each other at the Table Tennis World Championships in Sweden. Instead, they will present a united front. And that is our moment of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask for your attention. I have a very, very big announcement to make. The Republic of Korea, commonly known as South Korea, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, commonly known as North Korea, have decided, due to the current political situation between the countries, not to compete against each other. Instead of competing against each other, we will, in the semifinals, for the first time in a very, very long time, see not North Korea, not South Korea, but unified Korea. Okay, so the last time they did this, uh, they played a ping pong game together, was in 1991, and they won gold at the World Championships, and they even went on to make a movie about it because it was such an extraordinary moment. Right, and, and I mean, of course, the whole thing is quite evocative of what we saw more recently than that, just this year in Pyeongchang, the Winter Olympics. We saw yeah. a unified women's hockey team. Uh, they didn't do nearly as well, mind you, uh, but they certainly got the world's attention. I... I... I don't know. I don't mean to be the cranky one here. I mean, it, it's not denuclearization, but it, it's something. And <laughs> I, I guess I'm just not sure where this, where this fits between meaningful gesture and stunt. Uh, because we, we've, we have seen this before, but, you know, then again, I guess this is a year where stunts are actually leading to some changes. So uh, I'm going to just ping, be cranky. Ping pong, ping pong can solve world problems, Adrian, it, I'm telling you. <laughs> yes. That's, that's the National okay. Fourth uh, this May 3rd. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.